in the world, no other God, no other religion can have purpose to your pain, could actually do something about your heartache, could actually give purpose to what you're struggling with. But here is someone whose heart was broken, and as a result, it saved his life, saved his marriage, saved his faith. What is up, everyone? We are back with another episode of Shaping the Culture. Now, like, let's just get to it. The whole secular, sacred divide. There is no distinction in, in the scriptures. Some of us have trust issues with God. And right, some right. of us, yeah, it's like, does God really got us? You can't engage the culture with the gospel that first has not engaged you. Like, you know how people are like, oh, that's just who I am. No. No. <laughs> Shaping the code. What is up, everyone? We are back with another episode of Shaping the Culture. Hope all is well with you all, fam. Hope you're having a fantastic start to your week. I'm glad to be back. I took a couple weeks off. I was in South Africa uh, on a ministry trip, and uh, it was a great time. It was a great time. So, But I did miss podcasting, miss putting out episodes, and it's uh, good to be here with you all today. Uh, while I was gone, um, the news broke out that Carl Lentz came back to the public. Uh, he started his podcast entitled Lights On with Carl Lentz. Shout out to B-Side. Shout out to Tim Ross. They're killing it right now, doing the thing. And so um, because I was so busy while I was out there, I didn't have time to watch any of the episodes. But Yesterday and today, I binge watched the first three episodes and fam, I was hooked. And so what I want to do today is take the time to give my thoughts on the whole matter, what happened, where he's at, all of that. But I want to I want to start by saying that <laughs> this is not one of those reaction videos where I'm going to grill uh, Carl Lentz, or I'm going to say a bunch of negative things. Um, I'm actually under the conviction. I've told this to multiple people. I would rather talk to them than talk about them. In fact, Carl, if you're watching this, hit me up. I love to interview you. Um, but this video is, is not so much a reaction to Carl Lentz as much as it is Christian culture and how Christian culture has responded or did respond to Carl Lentz. And I, I've got a lot of thoughts on that, something that I've been thinking and feeling for honestly like four years. And a lot of the content I consumed from Carl Lentz's podcast kind of justify what I was feeling and, and help uh, put language to some of the things that I was processing. And, and so I feel a little bit more confident saying what I'm saying because he's spoken out um, and he shared his thoughts and his side of the story. And so it's a lot easier to make remarks. That, you know, you don't want to gossip or you don't want to lead with assumptions. You want to assume the best about people. You want to be charitable. And so based off the info we got from the first three episodes, I want to give my my reaction, my thoughts on the whole situation. And so, yeah, this this isn't going to be one of those videos again that I'm just going to be grilling the man uh, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna have an honest look at ourselves. And so, uh, like the last few episodes, we got the one and only Parker with us in the back. What's good, Parker? Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yo, for those who know me, uh, I really wish I could sing. I really wish I could sing, but, um, yeah, God just, for whatever reason, didn't give me that gift. Look, so. man, some people wish they could teach. Yeah, I'm just gonna stick with what he gave me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Parker, he he got he got five gifts. Okay. Y'all know All the right. parable of the talents. All right. Matthew 25. This man could record and edit videos. He can produce beats. He can rap. He can sing. Okay. He won't sing to you, but if you check out his records, I might sing about you. <laughs> he if might you do me right or if you, you do me wrong. Hey, oh. <laughs> we'll find out. Yeah, we'll find out. Either way, we'll find out. Yeah. Um, and so, anyways. That's what this episode is about. Um, I want to start off again by saying I am so thrilled. It has been a delight. I have been enjoying Carl Lentz back in the public. I, um, I'll give you kind of like my background with him. Um, 
<laughs> when he first like popped on the scene for me, I was in college and, you know, I, I was in the era, I was in a season of life where I was very self-righteous. And so I was consuming a lot of reformed pastors and teachers. And I, <laughs> I honestly remember like looking at his messages and being like, oh, this dude ain't sound. This dude ain't teaching the text. This dude is all zeal and passion. And uh, the Lord humbled me very quickly. And uh, it, it didn't take long. It didn't even take a year before I started to really appreciate his content, his messages. Um, I started to see the influence that God had been giving him, the church in New York City, um, and beyond my appreciation for what God was doing in him and through him, um, I became blessed by his ministry, and I was moved by a lot of what he was teaching. Um, he used to have a saying back in the day, occupy your street, just this idea of like live on mission where you are. And I remember in college that really spoke volumes to me. And that was something that I wanted to take on and, and, and really apply. And, and you could tell, I mean, he's a very passionate speaker. And so he really loved people. I, I, I still, I don't know the guy personally, but I believe he loves people. And so you could just see in his preaching and his teaching, um, with the tears, with his the voice inflections, with his body language, with his tone, like he was serious about seeing people come to know who Jesus was. And there was something about that that was infectious. There was something about that that really stood out to me. And, and, and then I started following his, his journey. And uh, yeah, grew, we went from, I went from <laughs> judging the man to appreciating him to being blessed by his ministry, being blessed by his ministry. And um, I really did appreciate the way he was able to navigate culture. So th the name of this podcast is called Shaping the Culture. And in those days, I didn't have very many examples of Christians, at least that I knew of, or at least I was in the public life, people that were actually in culture, shaping culture outside of Carl Lentz. Lecrae was probably the only person I knew that was in culture like that. And, and at the time, it wasn't cool. Like, Lecrae was getting dragged for being in culture. And 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 so th there was an appeal to me about that, too. Like, I, I don't know if I always agreed with Carl Lentz's approach to answering questions on, on secular platforms, but I always was praying for the man, rooting for the man. I knew how difficult it was to be caught in a catch-22, to be asked questions knowing millions of people are answering when you want to lead with love and truth and what does that look like? And I know when you're a pioneer, you're one of the first to do it, you get criticized. And so I always had a lot of grace for him because he was figuring it out. I, I never was really offended by the way he would go about things. I, I was always like, man, he'll do it. Same with Lecrae. Like I remember when Lecrae went on The Breakfast Club and people thought he dropped the ball and I'm just like, bro, like he's, this is his first time here. And so, um, I don't know. I, I, I think part of that, is, I think God has made me that way. Like where I just believe the best about people. And, you know, I know what it's like to be in front of a camera. I know what it's like to lead people. I, even doing this podcast, like you're in conversations and sometimes you struggle to say what you really want to say or ask the question that you want to struggle or dig a little, like I get that, you know? And so there was a lot of grace there, but, but nonetheless mad inspired by Carl Lentz and the way he moved in culture and the way he impacted people for the gospel, like baptizing pop artists and, and NBA players and, and all of that good stuff. Like that was like really cool. I know people had their critiques, but I was inspired by that. I, I was genuinely inspired by that. And, and so when the news came out, I remember this vividly in, 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 in 2020, um, that he had cheated on his wife and that he was stepping down and then all the events that followed after I actually, that took a toll on me, like that genuinely bothered me and hurt me. Um, and around the same time, I don't know if you guys remember, but Ravi Zacharias also had his big downfall. And I remember being in Los Angeles, you know, my siblings lived there at the time and we were there visiting. And I remember being in a hotel room and I was just processing everything from, from Carl Lentz to Ravi and I had a panic attack and I... <laughs> I'll never forget it. 
Um, it was very hard for me to breathe. It was very hard for me to um, even lay down. I had to sit up. That wasn't working. I had to walk around. That didn't work. So I literally got out of the hotel and walked down the streets of L.A. like at two in the morning trying to get some air, <laughs> trying to like shake this panic attack off. And, you know, in the moment, I didn't know what that was about. I don't know why I had it. I didn't even link. Like, I didn't think I had the panic attack because of that. It was later on when I processed and I realized, yo, like, these were two men that I valued for different reasons. I mean, Ravi, when it comes to apologetics, when it comes to defending the faith, when it comes to um, uh, answering difficult questions, like, he's somebody that I really consumed. And, and then when I looked at Carl and somebody that, man, was in culture, impacting culture, spreading the love of God, like, these were two people who loved the Lord and, and, and were making an impact and they both in different spheres of influence, both respected in their own worlds, different camps, theological camps. Um, they both fell. And I remember the reason why I had the panic attack was like, I was thinking to myself, well, like if they could fall, I could fall. <laughs> that was like genuinely a thought that I had. Um, and I remember in 2020, it was already tough with like COVID and George, I mean, living in Minneapolis, like there was a lot going on. I, there was a lot of pressure. There's a lot of things happening. And I was like, yo, these are, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to use the word heroes today and, 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 and in this season of my life, but these were two giants. These are two people that I looked up to for different reasons. And I'm like, if, if Ravi with all that he knows and with Carl, with all the influence that he has, can both fall like is there hope for me <laughs> you know what I mean like little old me and you know of course there is and you know th these are men we can learn from but Christ is our ultimate example and you know men are men and men fail people I fail people and 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 I have to be okay with that and and when they fall the proper response is to pray for them like if I was personally in their lives just to help restore them but here here here's what I, this is the crux of what I want to talk about because when I saw the way people responded, when I saw the way Christians responded online in the comment sections, the blogs that I saw being written, at that time, YouTube wasn't a thing. People weren't really making reaction videos like that. But there was enough going on in culture where I felt grieved and I felt upset. And I was like, yo, this man <laughs> is, is literally caught in sin his wife just found out what happened his kids are in the mix and we're dragging them on the internet and i remember being infuriated and and, and it didn't take long for me to go from processing the hurt of him falling to like me processing the fact that as christians we are trash when it comes to responding to people who have fallen from um their position or people that have um, fallen in sin or backslided or whatever it is. And, and when he came out, let me tell you this, like the, the episode that I watched today, the third one, him and his kids, listening to his kids process the way people responded to them, both in the public and in their personal lives, I ain't gonna hold you, bro. I was in tears 80% of that podcast episode. And it really, I mean, the reason why I want to talk about this, because it's like, yo, my assumptions are right. Like you, they weren't really public about their hurt or how, you know, all the things that were going on behind the scenes. But I could only imagine reading the comment sections like this. This is ridiculous. And it began to like dawn on me that like we as a church culture don't know what to do with people's sin. <laughs> um. It's so fascinating that we know what to do with sin pre-conversion. We don't know what to do with sin once you're in Christ. And for whatever reason, we, we fail to understand that grace isn't just enough to get us saved, but it's the grace of God that keeps us saved. Like, I, I, I don't know. I think we forget that the, the power in which 
uh, dwells with the power that saved us, the spirit of the living God that raised us from the dead and made us alive is the same spirit that keeps us alive. And so we've got to understand that like when people are struggling, when people fall, the response is very simple and laid out in the scriptures. It's to restore them. So I want to read Galatians Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit <laughs> should restore that person gently. So many observations based off of that sentence alone. The first observation is this. If someone is caught in sin, meaning Paul makes it very clear and abundantly clear to the, the, the church of Galatia that this is going to be this is going to happen. And when it happens, you shouldn't be surprised. Rather, this is how you are to respond. Paul lets us know in Galatians 6 1 by saying, if someone's caught in a sin, that we should make room for people who are going to be caught in sin, that this shouldn't take us off guard. And then secondly, let me actually like put like if anybody's ever read the the the, the book of First Corinthians, oh my gosh, the the church <laughs> the Corinth the Church of Corinth was wild, bro. Like sons were sleeping with their fathers' wives, and the way he addresses them is he says church. Paul says brothers and sisters. They're wilding, doing the the ugliest of sins doing the things that they have no business doing, things that Christians don't do. Yet and still, Paul displays patience, he displays, he displays kindness, and he holds them accountable to their identity in Christ. He doesn't question their salvation. He challenges them and says, this is not who you are. You are a brother. You are a sister in the faith. Let me instruct you on how to live out this thing that you said yes to. And I, I don't feel like we know how to do that in Christian culture today. When people fall, it's a surprise. And when people fall, we write them off. But this is what Paul continues to tell us. Second observation, you who live by the Spirit. You know, it's crazy, Parker. I feel like a lot of people got exposed. There's a lot of Christians out here who aren't living by the Spirit, which makes me wonder, are they really Christian to begin with? <laughs> like, yo, this, this is wild. Like, Paul is making a distinction here. He's saying, you who live by the Spirit. Meaning, I don't want just any YouTuber. I don't want just any blogger. I don't want just any teacher, any Christian. I want someone who walks in step with the Spirit of God. I want someone who's sensitive to the Spirit of God. I want someone who knows the heart of God. I want someone who knows how to deal gently with people who have fallen. Hey, don't be surprised, but B, I'm looking for people who actually know the Lord, who are sensitive to his spirit, who love his word, who love his ways, who love his people. He goes on to say, you should restore that person. And I feel like in Christian culture today, we got a lot of Christians who are canceling other Christians, who are condemning other Christians, who are shaming other Christians. We've got a lot of people in our day and age today that are speaking about things that they have no business speaking on. Um, again, I waited four years to say what I'm saying because I didn't really know. I mean, Carl Lenz made it public. He invited us into that and hearing their story, it really, I was like, okay, I can, I can now process this out loud because it's public information. But yo, like where, where are the saints who are committed to seeing their brothers come back to the faith. Like that we call people out, not because we want them to feel bad. By the way, like if, if you're a Christian, you know, when you sin, you feel bad. <laughs> like I don't really know any Christian who does a sin and doesn't feel bad about it. Like I, unless they seared their consciousness to a point where they're numb, which that does happen. Like most people know what they're doing is wrong. And Paul's saying, don't call them out for the sake of calling them out. Call them out because you want to see them get up. You want to see them do better. You want them to, to get right back in alignment with the will of God for their lives. You want them to get back up so that they can continue on in the things that God has for them and their family. Like, 
we don't call people out simply to call people out is because they, there's something broken here. There's something that they've missed. There, sin literally means to miss the mark. They've missed the mark on something and you want to help them get back on track. You want to help them get back in position to live out the life that God has promised them in Christ Jesus. And then he doesn't just say the goal is to restore them. He says the goal is to restore them gently, gently. Like, I, I don't see a lot of gentleness on the internet right now. I don't see a lot of gentleness in Christian culture right now. Carl Lentz, like, alluded to this in the first episode. He says, I know a lot of pastors struggling, but because they saw how the church and culture responded to him, they refused to be public about their sin. So they're just dealing with it in-house and privately. They have no intention. They have no desire to confess. They have no desire to bring this to the light or to the public, not because they don't want to, not because they don't want to do better, but because they're afraid that they're going to be eaten by their own, that they're going to be devoured by their own. The same ones that are called to restore gently are going to be the ones that will cancel, that will write off, that will speak negatively about, that will disassociate themselves with. And uh, I don't know, man, I'm grieved. I'm grieved. I'm grieved. And, and I feel like we, we, we got to do better. Like I, when, when people fall, our job is to help them get back up. One of my favorite Bible verses says, the righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up eight times. Like w- watch this for a second. What makes you righteous isn't the fact that you didn't fall. What makes you righteous is the fact that you got up after you fall. <laughs> there's there is a key distinction there like righteousness has very little to do with living perfectly here's the reality we won't live perfectly christianity isn't about being perfect christianity is about trusting in the perfect one so it's not about doing everything right it's about when you drop the ball when you make a mistake you you run to the feet of jesus you run to the cross of jesus you you this is Christianity. The gospel is this, that you would look away from yourself, that you would take your eyes off of yourself, and that you would put your eyes on the one who would actually save you, the one that actually can heal you, the one that actually can make you whole, the one that can restore you. The gospel is this, he who knew no sin became sin so that you and I could become the righteousness of God. He took on our sin, he overcame our sin, and now he's imputed his righteousness upon us. And so when we fall, we have the, we have the freedom to tell on ourselves, to snitch on ourselves, because our identity doesn't lie in what we do and what we don't do. It lies in the finished work of Jesus. And so the righteous person knows that they're not made right with God because of what they've done, but because of what Jesus has done. And so when they fall, they look to Christ. When they, the, Paul says, my life is hidden in Christ. <laughs> I love that verbiage. Like my life is hidden in Christ. Like I am behind Jesus. Like he's the one that makes me right. He's the one that uh, establishes me. He's the one that perfects me. He's the one that presents me in front of the father. He's the one that uh, uh, saves me. And so in the same way, when somebody falls, we don't write them off. We help them get back up because the righteous man gets back up. And how do you get up? Not in your own strength, not in your own wisdom, not in your own way, but in the finished work of Jesus, there's strength, there's grace, there's power, there is the ability to be restored. And and, and here, here's what I'll say too. There, there's a caveat. Like I I get it. He there was a standard set and he he didn't meet that standard. I'm not making an excuse for what happened. And something that I've really appreciated about Carl Lentz watching these three first three episodes is he's owned it every single episode. He's not made excuses. He's give, I like how you made the dis- distinction between excuses and reasons. He's given us reasons. He's given us context. He's helped us understand maybe why some of those decisions were made or why he fell, but he's never given himself an excuse for what he's done. And so... I'm not saying that we should totally write him off. Like he, he, he did the right thing. He got off the internet and he chose to heal. Instead of defending himself, he chose to heal. In the first episode, one of his friends or meant whatever, I forgot which one, told him just let the rain fall. Like this, it's just this time to like accept what it is. 
It's not about you. It's not about you uh, getting your image right, your reputation right. You need to fight for your family. And that's what he did. And it's it's different than 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 Saul. Y'all remember what happened when Saul got caught in sin? <laughs> Instead of trying to get right with God, he's like, well, can you make a statue in my name so that the people can worship? Here he is offending a holy God, and he's more concerned about how people see him than how God sees him. This is the difference between Saul and David. When David is made aware of his sin, he goes straight to God and says, would you restore in me the joy of my salvation? He repents. He says, I've sinned against you and you alone, O oh God. And he, conf- he doesn't care about how people perceive him. He doesn't care about how people look at him. He says, yo, I have, it's so funny how he says, I've sinned against you and you alone. No, you've actually sinned against Bathsheba, against her husband, against your, but like he understands before them, I've offended a holy God. And that's something I've seen in Carl Lentz's actions. Be, before he's trying to made it, make it right with others, he's trying to make it right with God, trying to make it right with his family. And now he's trying to make it right with his life to the public, which I, I also really respect and appreciate. I, I said a lot. Parker, you got, you got thoughts? I mean, you covered a lot, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> I just, bro, I, I've got, bro, four years. I was going to say, listen, four years you, I've been waiting on this. You stacking up. But no, I think that's a good point, bro. I think that um, a lot of what I recall learning wasn't how to Mm -hmm. restore our brothers and sisters when we fall. Yeah. Um, And I've even had experiences that when I have fallen or when it was supposed that maybe I did something wrong, that the approach wasn't gentleness. It wasn't grace. It wasn't, hey, how can we fix something that's clearly broken? Because if such and such happened, okay, that means like there's there's something wrong here yes. and we need to come around you and, and support you like as, as we're called to do. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think that it's interesting because that's not something that I think is often talked about. Yeah. Um, I think it's talked about like how we should live, how we should pursue people, how to evangelize and all those things are good things. Yeah. But I, I think that um, in the same vein as when we get saved, we're not saved uh, by good works. We're saved for good works. And in that yes. same vein, while we're doing those good works, okay, yes. what does it look like when there needs to be correction? Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that in, even, I thought it was funny how you said how Carl mentioned, like, he knows people that are struggling, but because of how he was treated, like, that's hindering other people from walking in the, in the grace that He they lost need. friends. He, I mean, he lost a lot. Yeah. He lost a yeah. lot. Yeah. Bro, you know what, First John says this in chapter 1, verse 5, for this message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And then he doubles down in verse 10 and says again, if we claim to have, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. He's talking about what it looks like to fellowship with the Father, walk in the light. For the longest, I thought walking in the light, light meant not living a sinful life, being without blemish, like spotless, doing everything right. But then as he's talking about walking in the light, he's like, when you walk in the light, then you'd be forgiven of your sins. Like, wait a minute. Like, if walking in the light means living a spotless life, like, what does this whole forgiving of sins mean? Well, it's because walking in the light has nothing to do with living a perfect life. Walking in the light means bringing your sin to the light. And when you bring your sin to the light, then you are forgiven. If you are confessed, he is faithful and just. But to what you are saying, bro, like how can any of us bring our sin to the light if it ain't, if it ain't safe in the light? <laughs> Damn. Like God is telling us that the way we will overcome our sin is by bringing our darkness to the light. But how many times have we brought our thing to the light and we've got ridiculed, we've got gossiped about, we've got we've got judged, all of these things. And and so, bro, and I love how he goes on to say in verse eight, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And then in verse 10, he says, if we claim, claim we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar. So it's just like, yo, we all got sin. We all got mistakes that we make. And we all have to get in a rhythm of bringing it to the light. 
But if we're not curating a safe space, if, if we're not, a, if we don't have a culture of restoring people gently, guess what? That sin is going to stay in the dark. And as that sin stays in the dark, it's going to grow. Because if you're not bringing it to the light, how can you be forgiven? By the way, confession in the New Testament is always seen in the context of community. Repentance is between you and God. Confession is public. It's bringing it to the light. And when you bring it to the light, God tells us he'll forgive us. And he goes on to say, Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. There's something about walking in the light that purifies us, that makes us right, that makes us just, that makes us whole. We were not meant to keep our sin in the dark. But when you don't have a culture where you can talk about your sin, when you don't have a culture where you don't, you're not seen first as a child of God, and guess what? You're going to keep that thing to yourself, and that thing is going to grow and grow. And before you know it, you've got this monster, and it's going to overtake you. And unfortunately, that's what happened. But again, my critique is, okay, pastors are falling. There's something wrong there. But we got to look at ourselves. What about us? Like, why do people feel like, like, forget Carl Lentz is, is unfortunately an example. But like, we can look at him and judge his life. But how many of us do we know? Let's even look at ourselves in the mirror. How many of us actually confess our sin? who actually talk about the things that we're struggling with, who actually say, you know what? I lied yesterday. I got to confess that before you turn into a liar or who, who say, man, I, I thought I was better than this person. And, and now we're, we're growing that pride in the dark and we're not confessing that and we're not putting it to death and we're not being purified and we're not walking in the light. Like, and, and before we know it, we're going to find ourselves in a compromising situation. I love what KB says in The Art of Drifting. What, what was that line? He says uh, it was like 100 bad decisions or 100 falls before that big, that great fall yeah, or something like he that. He said uh, 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 nobody wakes up addicted. Every great fall is from 100 bad decisions. Nobody wakes up addicted. What say that last line? Sorry, I forgot it. Uh, <laughs> nobody wakes up addicted. Nobody wakes up addicted. Every great falls from 100 bad decisions from 100 bad decisions fam that's all you want to talk about conviction it's scary i see another man to say my goodness good god today so i man that's just something that's been burning on my heart something that's frustrated me but <laughs> there, there's so much to say about that but like i gotta also point out the obvious something that carl lentz has done that i think is beautiful in these last three episodes is he's gotten to the root of the problem so he's talked about his, um, he was sexually assaulted, abused when he was a child. Again, he's not bringing this up as an excuse, but he's giving reason. He's trying to make sense of this. He had a lot on his plate. Like, you know, he had a drug addiction. There's a lot going on. And one thing that I liked about the way you could tell Carl Lentz is healed and healing. You could tell he's done the work because he's not giving us Bible lingo. He's not just saying Bible verses and sprinkling Jesus. I'm like, yo, this man has been working on himself. He's been working on himself. And the reason why that's important is because we see this even in the scriptures. I love me and my community. We've been walking through this because we believe in emotionally healthy discipleship. And we want to be emotionally well, not just spiritually well. In fact, Pete Scazzaro says, you know, you cannot be spiritually healthy if you're not emotionally healthy, right? And and in his series of books, he he hits on this idea of epigenetics, right? And I want I want to actually talk about this because this is something that like we don't talk about enough in the church, and this is something that I'm hearing in Carl Lentz's verbiage and language and how he's processing things. Like some of the the sins that we commit, again, I'm not taking away responsibility. We committed those sins, but how many of our sins were learned? behaviors, something that was passed down, something that's within our, so here's what epigenetic, epigenetics teaches us is that you don't just take your eye color from your parents, your height from your parents. You also take their traumas. You also take their dis, dis, decision-making abilities. You also take on um, a lot of their fears. Like, a, in fact, there was a, a, John Mark Comer talks about this. There's a study done on the survivors of the Holocaust 
they looked at them. They had this gene inside of them from the trauma that they endured under the Holocaust. And then they, 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 they took a look at their grandkids, their grandkids who are living in California, who are generations removed from the Holocaust, who are in, they weren't in Germany, they're in America. And they did a study and they found the same gene in those people, in the, in the grandkids. And so now here are some 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds who are generations removed from the Holocaust, but still being triggered by the same things their grandparents were triggered by because of that gene that flowed down from generation to generation. And, and you know, John Mark Comer makes this argument. I know Pete Scazzaro makes this argument, but like you see this even in the scriptures. So let me make it practical. Abraham, when he leaves his country and follows the great promise that God has for him, runs up to a king and he's scared that the king will will kill his wife so he lies and says this isn't actually my wife this is my sister and so the king takes sarah from abraham now what's interesting is if you keep reading genesis just a couple of chapters later you look down and you see that isaac makes the same mistake isaac also lies to the same king in the same nation about who his wife is there's something getting passed down, like lies are being passed down. Not only that, Abraham has, he, he plays favoritism. In his sin, Ishmael comes into the picture, so obviously he favors Isaac over Ishmael. Isaac picks up on that favoritism. And now when Isaac has Jacob and Esau, what does he do? He now not only lies to the same king in the same nation about who his wife is, he also plays favoritism. He favors Ishmael over Jacob. So, and we know how the story goes. Jacob is jealous. His wife gets in the mess. It's, it's messy. There's like family drama in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. And so what ends up happening is Jacob ends up getting the blessing. But watch this. Jacob learned how to lie and play favoritism from his father, Isaac, who got it from his, his father, Abraham. Now watch this. <laughs> when Jacob has kids, guess what? He also plays favoritism. Who does he favor? Joseph. And now the 11 other brothers, they pick up on this jealousy. And when they sell Joseph off to slavery, they go back and lie to their father about what happened to Joseph. Look how lying is getting passed. Like the, the sin of lies is getting passed down. The, the, the sin of, of favoritism is getting passed down because one generation didn't address the sin. They're just doing it. Like you just see the patterns and something that Carl Lentz is doing as he's processing how he fell in sin is he's acknowledging like, yo, I, I'm responsible. I made a mistake, but there's some things that were outside of me. There's some things that I dealt with. There were some things that had happened to me. There's some things that I grew up with. There's some things that I had seen that led me to this decision. And I, and I think as Christians that like we need to do that work. We need to do that self work of like identifying, OK, you don't just struggle with lust. Like I was talking with a pastor friend of mine. Actually, shout out to Ficker, Ficker who's been on this and we we're talking about pornography and he's been doing this deep dive, dive on it. And he was sharing like he's like, bro, you know, most people, most men don't struggle with pornography because they've got a lust issue. They've got all these other issues that are leading them to run to pornography. So sometimes the, wh why we're running to pornography is because we're looking for acceptance because we never got it from our fathers. Maybe we're lonely and, and, and pornography gives us a false sense of intimacy. And so like if we're not doing the serious work of truly understanding what's happening in us, what's broken in us, what's being passed down, identifying why we do what we do, and then going to a therapist, going to re whatever it is to actually dive deep into all of the mess, how can we seriously get the healing that we need? And, and here's what I'll say. I think, shout out to the Perrys, Jesus and therapy, right? But, but watch this, like you need therapy to understand your sin, but you need Jesus to help you overcome your sin. There is help in understanding. There is a level of overcoming and understanding, but overcoming doesn't come by simply understanding why you do what you do. You need to run to Jesus to get the healing that you need. And here, Carl Lentz is talking about how he's identified why he is what he's done and how he's turned to Jesus again in the gospel to get what he needs to overcome the thing that he's battled with all these years that he didn't even know about until things hit the fan. And so 
I've thoroughly enjoyed it because this is like he he looks dangerous. Carl Lentz seems dangerous to me right now because this is a man who's like healed and healing. This is a man who's more confident than he's ever been. This is a man who identifies the gospel in ways he has never identified with the gospel. Here's a man that knows and sees the love of God in a way that he's never seen and known the love of God. And I get excited hearing him talk. The episode with his kids, bro, you, I promise you, you're going to be crying if you're not crying 50% of that episode, you're not human. <laughs> but, yo, just watching them unpack. And here's what I'll say, too. Sometimes God has to break your heart to save your soul. <laughs> Carlin said this. I don't know if it's episode one or two, but, like, he doesn't wish what he went through on anybody. But he also acknowledges that that needed, like, it made him better. He was able to see how all of the mess births something beautiful. And now he's more present with himself than he's ever been. Him and his family are more close than they had ever been. And they see God in ways that they've never seen God before. And one thing I've learned time and time again, again, this is not, I'm not saying go and sin and go have a big downfall or whatever. But I, man, this is, this is why I'm a Christian because it's only our God who can make an evil or a terrible situation flip flip upside down and, and become good for us all of a sudden. There, in the world, no other God, no other religion can have purpose to your pain, could actually do something about your heartache, could actually give purpose to what you're struggling with. But here is someone whose heart was broken, and as a result, it saved his life, saved his marriage, saved his faith. And it's a cautionary tale, no doubt about it. But man, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking to myself like, yo, sometimes things have to be broken in order for us to be healed. Sometimes things have to go south in order, in order for us to get the healing that God has for us. And so I've been processing that too. I've got one more thing I want to share on the thing. But again, I said a whole lot again. Parker, what are your, Sorry, bro. I, clearly, I've been thinking about this. I'm, I'm not even tripping. I'm trying to recap everything that you talked about. Yeah. Um, yeah, bro. I, I do think that the generational piece is something that I think a lot of people skip over because I think that we, and rightfully so, right? We love to claim that, oh, we're redeemed from this and like this is broken and chains are broken. Like, yeah, that also takes work. And so things that yeah. you may be dealing with aren't always uh, a direct result of what we think it is to your point, like even with yeah. pornography. So it's not always, no. we're just these uh, carnal ravaging beasts <laughs> that are just looking for something. And you know what I mean? Like some people might need to, <laughs> that might be their situation. They need yeah. to check on it. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of times it is like, it's loneliness. It's yeah. uh, looking for acceptance. It's fear. It's yeah. frustration. It yeah. could be you uh, punishing somebody else because, oh, I'll, you didn't say this and I'm going to go do this. And yeah. in reality, you're still punishing yourself. And so <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think that, uh, yeah, it's a number of different things. So I think that, uh, yeah, to your point, Jesus and therapy. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm not gonna add much else to be honest. You, bro, you hit all the points. Man, I've been, you've been, you've been bro. I'm so minute. happy for Carl. I don't know how to explain this it, bro. Man is joyful, joyful, <laughs> because like this is the promise of the gospel. Hmm. This is Romans chapter eight. There is no sin. There is what death, what angel, demon, like nothing can separate us from the love of God. No sin, no disease, and. Very rarely do we see, I mean, it's easy to talk about the downfall, but we need to also celebrate the comeback. Mm. And this, like our brother is restored. Like, that's why I'm excited. Like it didn't end him. And, and this is why I, I struggled so much with people who were judging him and writing him off. And I'm like, bro, like, this is your brother. This is, this is someone that like, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm so passionate. I don't even have the words right now. And so I'm, I'm just happy the brother's back, bro. That And, yo, props to him, too, because he's been going on some, like, major platforms and getting interviewed. And he's he's not shying away. He's not backing down from the hard conversations. Only a healed and a healing person can address the past like that. To know that he's at the mercy of whatever whatever question that they're going to ask, whatever tone, however people are going to respond and be like, no, nah, like I know who I am. I know what God has done. I am a testament of the goodness and faithfulness of God. The gospel is real. The gospel didn't just save me. It restored me, bro. This is why I'm a Christian. This is, this is, this is why we look to the cross because this is the power of the cross. And, um, 
I guess I'll, I'll end it off with like the story of the prodigal father, the prodigal son, not the prodigal father, sorry, the prodigal son. Um, by the way, you guys should all read the book Prodigal God by Tim Keller. That book messed me all the way up. In fact, I need to read that book once more. And 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 here's 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 it all. I mean, you guys, if those who are tuning in, I'm pretty sure a big chunk of you guys are Christian. And this is one of the mo- more popular stories. I won't spend too much, but there are some historical context pieces that help bring the story to life for me. One being like when the son did what he did and ran off, he basically told the father, I, I, I wish you were dead. When he asked for his inheritance, he's like, I just, you are a hindrance to what I want. I wish you weren't here anymore. Like, I just want to live my life. And in Jewish culture and custom, that was, that was enough to be punished by death. And so we all know the story. He's out in the world. He comes to his senses. He comes back after he, you know, loses everything. And the Bible tells us, that the, the, it's the small details, that while he was a far way off, like as he was far off, the father saw him. And then Jesus continues to tell the parable and it says he ran to him. And again, what's so fascinating about that is how long, how many days was the father, like how did he see his son? That just goes to show he was waiting, he was anticipating, he was believing, he was hoping that his son would come back. So much so that when he was a distance away, when he was far off, he saw him, he was looking for him. Like, like think about that for a second. Like when we're in our dirt, when we're in our mess, we have a God that's patiently waiting for us, who's awaiting our return, who is excited about the day where we come to our senses. Secondly, in, in Jewish custom and culture, it was fr- heavily frowned upon for Jewish men to run because in order for you to run, you would have to gird your loins. Like these loins, like they, uh, they're not like skirts or dresses, but these like long robes. And in order for you to run effectively, you have to pull up, I'm just going to say your skirt, whatever. I don't know what the technical term is. And like wrap it around your waist so that your legs had the freedom to run. And in doing so, you would, you would expose your feet and your legs. And that was a big no-no. First of all, Jewish men don't run. Jewish men don't expose their feet, which I get. I don't know why men out here exposing their feet like that <laughs> in 2024. Put some socks on, bro. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's that toxic masculinity. Um, but like, look at, like, as Jesus is giving this parable, he's offending the Pharisees. Because this is how scandalous the grace of God is that he will abandon himself, he would abandon his community, he would abandon his culture, he would abandon the norms of the day to get back to his son. And, I mean, we know the story, they embrace, he's, he's been eating with the pigs, he doesn't smell decent. He's been eating pig's food, his breath, and there's just this, and before the prodigal son can even finish giving an explanation, he says, quick, let's get him the robe, Let's throw him a party. Let's get the fattened calf. My son was once lost, but now he's found. Bro, like, if if we don't have that attitude towards people, forget, like, Carl Lentz is, again, an example, but, like, we don't even have that attitude towards our brothers and sisters in the church, people in our families, people in our communities. Like, have we truly understood the gospel? Like, is this some, like, social club where, like, you got to, like, be VIP and you get in and you're like one of the cool kids. And the moment somebody like stops doing what y'all been doing, you just write them off and you disgrace them. You disregard like that's not the heart of the father. He will literally leave the 99 for the one. And let's not forget at what at one point in time you were the one. And I'm just happy our brother is back. And I'm excited. I love the podcast. I love what what it's been so far. I have high hopes for it. I believe it's going to continue to minister to people, bless people. It's already blessed me. And uh, yeah, I think I said everything I needed to say. It's probably one of the shorter episodes, but (laughs) I had to say it, man. Carl Lentz, we're glad you're back, bro. And uh, again, if you ever want to come on Shaping the Culture, I'd love to have a conversation with you, but 
Yeah, man. I, I really do hope that like we look at his story, um, not, not like in, in shame or, or by looking, I, I just, I hope that when we look at that, we, we see a display of God's unending grace that we look at the power of the love of God, that when we look at that story, we get to see just how powerful the gospel is. My pastor used to always tell me, don't ever minimize your sin. Because the moment you minimize your sin, you minimize the glory of the cross. And you minimize you minimize the cost of salvation. So be bold about your sin so that you could be bold about his saving power. If you if you if you're not honest about what you did, where you were, you'll never be able to fully appreciate what he's done and how he's brought you to himself. And so um, I know it got real ugly at one point. But like Carl Lentz has been saying the last three episodes, keep watching. The story is not over. And it's the same for you tuning in right now who's watching who feels like it's over. It's not over. We have. He has more grace to give than we have sins to commit. I love that one. Ironically, Hillsong song says my uh, my sin was great. Your love was greater. That's the gospel that we will never have so much sin that grace can't cover us. And so, um, yeah, man, I think that's all I have for today. That's all I have for this episode. Parker, you have any last thoughts before we wrap this one up? I'm not going to lie. I don't. You, uh, you hit a lot of points. I'm going I'm to leave it there. Leave it there. You said what you needed to say. Until next time, family, uh, peace and grace.